In the first half on our lecture on government-private enterprise relationships, we looked at M&E government relations models, and we also examined govern market theory and govern interdependence theory. In this lecture, we will continue our conversations on government-private enterprise relationships. So how did Japan and the newly industrialized nations do what they did so well? What helped them to make active government private enterprise policies relatively effective in the region, especially in the light of neoclassical predictions about rent seeking and information gaps? The general argument highlights key features of the organization and interaction of government and business, which can make effective coordination of the market a more likely outcome in, in the East Asian example. The concept of embedded autonomy becomes an important idea. This stresses bureaucratic coherence through meritocracy and personal networks as the key to the state's insulation. A number of conditions are essential if a state's policies are to be consistent with developmental and growth-oriented goals. One is that the bureaucracy has to be competent and committed to organizational objectives. This should be a familiar mantra to us as Weber discussed this idea in the conception of bureaucracy. The other is that the state's key policy-making agencies must be sufficiently insulated against special interest groups and clientelistic sort of pressures generally. Three main features of the East Asia's state internals organization is relevant in this regard. First, the quality and prestige of the economic bureaucrats. Second, a strong in-house capacity for information gathering. And third, the appointment of a key agency charged with the task of policy coordination. These conditions are significant insofar as they contribute to the insulation or autonomy of the bureaucracy, thereby preserving policy making for domination by special interests. Government service has traditionally conferred high status in East Asia. Merit-based recruitment and promotion of officials, rather than political appointment, has tended to minimize political manipulation of the bureaucracy. Consequently, governments have been able to attract high qualified individuals. The combination of talent and prestige has made for a highly motivated, competent, and cohesive bureaucracy, which has internalized national objectives. In matters of trade and business relations, Bureaucratic expertise is also enhanced by tendency to appoint engineers rather than economists. Bureaucrats are thus able to communicate easily with companies and do so with greater frequency. The second related feature of the core economic ministries is their powerful capacity for marshalling and analyzing economic information in-house. For instance, in Korea's key economic ministries, each maintain an efficient information network on their own. This has been to the point that the knowledge of a product demand, quality standards, and foreign market trends has been better or similar to private sectors. A key aspect of the information gathering network in Korea has been the establishment of a mandatory reporting system. This allows the bureaucracy to keep close track of priority industries throughout the high growth period. In return for significant state support, these industries were required regularly to report on their export performance and on other areas of business activity. Failure to do so would incur sanctions ranging from fines and withdrawal of, of support to bankruptcy or even prison sentences. The important point is that through this monitoring system, the state gained access to up-to-date knowledge of production conditions in priority sectors. The contrasting case is where the public sector contracts out most or a large part of its research and information requirements, as sometimes occurs in the Australian and American settings. In Australia, for instance, it appears that even the definition of national visions is something better entrusted to a commercial consultancy firm like a McKinsey. The significance of these differences can be seen in the differential impact on state capacity. Two important consequences follow from the development of an in-house information-oriented capacity. 
One is that it gives state agencies a formable competence in areas normally left to the private sector. The other is that it nurtures bureaucratic independence vis-a-vis -vis sectorial interests within the business community. As is well known, none of the Anglo-American economies can boast similar attributes. From what has been said thus far, we can therefore conclude that the East Asian nations we have been exploring have an institutional advantage of, at the governmental level. In the existence of a talented, technically able, and prestigious public service, which is charged with a broad institutional mission and relatively insulated from special interests and which has developed an impressive in-house capacity for acquiring and managing production relevant information. Particularly in new or emerging industries, government-private enterprise relationships are important. To solicit the cooperation of the producers involved, the public sector absorbs most or all of the risk often mediating between producers and end users in the domestic market. The cases of robotics in Japan and textiles in Taiwan are instructive. In the Japanese case, what we saw here was the aim was to quicken the introduction of robots into the production process. To this end, it mediated between producers and potential end users by having a, a relationship uh, between MITI and the Japan Developmental Bank. To encourage end users, MITI, together with the Japan Developmental Bank, organize a leasing company that would enable domestic firms to lease robots under short term arrangements and to return them without expansive to satisfy with their performance. Since they significantly minimize investment risk, firms were increasingly willing to employ robots. And since this in turn effectively guaranteed a rapid expanding market for the producers of robots, the result was a socialization of risk and the establishment of a new industry. The establishment of a textile industry in Taiwan followed a similar process in the early 1950s, providing state guaranteed markets in order to encourage the spinning and weaving of yarn rather than the importing of finished cloth. In both cases, the core process is government initiated, but the success of the strategy depends on a mutually beneficial exchange between government and private enterprise. When we look at private sector initiatives and public policies, typically the sector in question is in a state of depression or decline, such as steel, shipbuilding, and textiles, and encouraged to coordinate a strategy uh, for survival. These initiatives are often taken at face value as evidence of state weakness and business domination, that is the state succumbing to pressure for assistance. Such an assumption, however, misses the point that, generally speaking, such initiatives are, are either directly or indirectly solicited by the state and are ultimately dependent upon the extent to which they meet publicly defined criteria. Frequently, the initiatives in question may be privately coordinated, as in cartels for regulating production or promoting export, a prominent feature of all the East Asian economies throughout their fast-growing period. Nowadays, such initiatives tend to be prominent in sectors which are troubled or are in decline or in need of restructuring. Whichever the case, the overall context is defined by the publicly sanctioned expectation that the sector should internally coordinate a strategy for the future, and it should link that strategy with the larger goals of public policy. In such cases, government has authorized industry to come up with its own plan for survival. The case of the textile industry in Taiwan typifies this relationship. Once Taiwan's premier exporter, but now declining due to price competition from second generation, newly industrialized countries, it was the textile industry itself that proposed a strategy to upgrade the sector. The state responded positively, not because of special favors or crafty lobbying, but because the proposal by, by private enterprises could meet the criteria for assistance and share in the financing of that proposal. In this case, the clinching factor was a strategy that would increase the value-added component of textile exports. Private initiatives can also fail, 
as it occurred in, in, in South Korea's petrochemical sector in the mid-1980s. In this case, government encouraged the industry to coordinate a plan for its future and thus avoid the problem of overcapacity. But the industry failed to reach agreement over new investment, output, and quotas. The result was a serious crisis of surplus capacity in the late 1980s. It is in such cases that state intervention often becomes necessary to correct business failure. Similar to what we would see in our following lectures on government NGO relationships, we are starting to see a trend where the state is retreating from areas of social concern, for instance, education and healthcare. As such, what we will see in the near future is greater government-private enterprise partnerships in these areas. Education holds a special appeal because of the obvious private function. The building and, maintain and maintenance of schools is relatively clear-cut and in theory uncontroversial for that reason. We see, for example, companies such as Microsoft who have provided computers to schools, or we see a rise of state subsidies for sending children to private schools. In healthcare, a public-private relationship is already a reality in many jurisdictions. And we see this is increasing in scope in other uh, nations who are following suit in this sort of trend. The idea here is that the developing government-private enterprise partnership initiatives can bring new facilities into healthcare service. One proposed approach is to create multi-use health-oriented facilities to generate private revenue streams that will help initial capital costs. This concludes our two-part lecture on government-private enterprise relationships. We will now turn our attention in our next lecture looking at government-NGO relationships.